Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. everybody is having a great start to your week uh, you saw the intro you know the work that we do in the community uh, it is imperative that you support the work we do uh, to continuously uh, expect outsiders to support work that empowers you to no longer be at their mercy uh, is beyond ridiculous at some point we're gonna have to get to the idea that the only way that we're going to actually do this and be effective doing it is to do it from the inside out, to expect uh, things to happen and be effective despite years and years and years of the song and dance, the sleight of hand, the appearance of funneling millions into supposedly uh, uh, pro-black uh, endeavors only to see no results and things get worse tells us that they know uh, what they are pretending to fund won't work. Uh, and and it, there's, there's a two-edged sword cutting both ways on this. Number one, the, the programs, uh, the people, the organizations, which are most of the time small grassroots organizations, aren't getting the funding they need to actually be effective. The people who with their hands actually on the pulse of the community aren't the people being supported. It's the big names, it's the brands, it's the um, quote unquote uh, non-profit non -profit industrial complex um, that has the big names, the photo, uh, photo ops uh, and everything else, but the work isn't actually uh, producing anything so you, you you lack funding the back end of it is when there are so many different uh narratives where millions and millions and millions are being pumped into saving the black community but things only get worse you start to see the narrative and the image being painted that we are a hopeless case and that it's us and that it's something inherent about blackness that makes us uh, prone uh, to the state that we find ourselves in without giving any consideration to the things that um, contribute to that. I have spent 30 plus years of my life outlining the enigmatic issues and producing solutions. Uh, and I will continue to do that as long as I have breath in my body. But I'm telling you that if you want to see real change, if you want to see re uh, real uh, empowerment, real liberation. It will not come by posting, oh my God, how horrible, that's ridiculous, enough is enough, and everything else that I see posted consistently on uh, various social media platforms and comment sections on websites. It's going to take investing in things that work. It's going to take a shift in paradigms and culture. It's going to take a shift in paradigms and how we handle money. It's going to take a shift in paradigms and how we develop our youth, how we establish identity, and so much more that we've done for years uh, through our program. So again, I'm challenging to support the work we do. Um, I'm here to talk about something that's um, long overdue, something nobody wants to talk about. Uh, and that is the attack on black manhood, the attack on black masculinity and the use of black women at a high rate uh, to facilitate it. And I'm going to explain what I meant. 
Uh, I believe being a black man, but also uh, a champion for the protection and loving of black women puts me in a position to where I have the license uh, to speak on this without being labeled uh, biased. Uh, I have fought very hard. I have been very critical of our men and how our men have handled our women. I have been very critical of misogyny and disrespect and the uh, sexual objectification of our women in music. I have done it in my writing. I have done it in my lectures. I teach it in my courses. It is something that I am adamant about. But let me explain something to you, and I need you guys to understand this. We are, as a race of people, regardless of gender, in a very precarious situation, one that we've been in for some time, and instead of things improving, they have only gotten worse. And the only way to do that is to evaluate solutions and develop within ourselves uh, agendas, uh, blueprints, codes of conduct, and behavior that is in alignment with the things we say we want. We can't talk about empowerment when there's internal conflict at the rate and level that we are experiencing it. It's the enemy on the inside that's doing the greatest amount of harm. It's not that the enemy on the outside doesn't exist, but as we know from the African proverb, it says that uh, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. So I'm concerned with the enemy on the inside, but just as much as I have championed the protection of black women, the loving of black women, uh, the caring for and nurturing and being a covering and a priest for black women, I must be very, very uh, direct and say that on the same side, we cannot replace or combat misogyny with misandry. We can't replace the hatred and disrespect and misuse and abuse of black women with the disrespect, disregard, marginalization, feminization, and emasculation of black men. It is absolutely not going to work. We have unique skills. We have new unique gifting. We have a unique design. Our brains work different. Our emotions are set different. Our spirits operate on different planes for, and they are meant to work together. We will only get as high as our women. Our spirits are able to lift us. We will only get as far as our men are physically able to lead us. And we cannot allow external forces to introduce negative uh, narratives that are diametrically opposed to the true idea of either male or female within our collective and expect to have true empowerment or liberation achieved in, in, in the scope of our lifetime. We are going to have to learn and understand that in order for us to do what we need to do, we've got to be operating in unison. No, we're not going to agree on everything. No, we're not going to always have... Um, direct alignment that's okay that's being human that's a part of who we are we think differently we move differently but we must have one specific agenda one specific direction one specific destination that we're all moving towards so that we can understand as long as we're moving each other towards this destination this destiny of ours of empowerment of liberation then we can sit up and have differences in philosophies of how we get there but it must begin with love and respect for one another it must begin with an understanding of when we are being used to tear down one another. And this white feminist idea of uh, manhood being pushed within the black community is subjective to a misinterpretation. First and foremost, I'm going to I'm only going to give you two ways today that it's happening and it's happening in four more ways but i want to talk about two ways just like i talk a lot about the music and the culture that the music creates when it comes to misogyny and the objectification sexual object objectification of our women we have to look at the media and look at ways in which the misandry component and element of the same machine is being pushed in the black community to create a wedge between black men and black women but i'm gonna show you how it's being done it's it, it's it's a very dangerous cyclical process that is leading us in a path of destruction and we don't get it and 
I don't know if I can even do it justice in one sitting, but I'm going to do the best that I can. All right, so you have first and foremost, let's take the subcategory first. Now, normally you would take the category, then you would go to the subcategory, toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity is a term that is created by two white men and coined and you have to be very careful it's 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 real similar in the way that black on black crime uh was coined when i look at black on black crime and i've written on the myth of black on black crime uh for years uh it's extensively in books in articles i've had lectures on it i've been interviewed on it um, and it's real simple it's not that blacks, that fratricide isn't an issue, that, that blacks aren't killing blacks, especially black men, killing black men. But, and, and not that we don't have a significant issue in intimate partner homicide and intimate partner violence. That's not the case. What we are not discussing and what, we, what, what makes it a, a challenge for me is that we don't hear about white on white crime. We don't hear about Asian on Asian crime. We don't hear about Latino on Latino crime. And why is that important? It's important because uh, violence, especially murder, is highly proximal. It is highly determined by uh, the people we're around the most. It's normally a crime of passion, a normally a crime of someone becoming enraged in a moment, and that normally happens around people you're around. Um, you know, white people aren't in the black hood in any large numbers getting upset with somebody and shooting them. But they are in their community. 84% of homicides, on average, 84% of homicides in the white community are committed by other homicides, but you never hear white on white. Um crime because the the term was created to produce a phenomenon that suggests that blacks are inherently more violent than anyone else the truth of the matter isn't the truth of the matter is you you, you have proximity then you have poverty which will automatically increase crime including violent crime so the combination of poverty the combination of proximity all of these things are going to lead to more black people harming black people it is simple mathematics it's it's uh criminology 101 penology 101 you can study it it's there but they're not going to tell you that they're going to give you the idea look at all these black folks killing each other uh all you got to do is watch a couple of seasons of snapped and you'll find out they kill each other a lot more than we do and uh, for a lot less provocation. Uh, but that's not what's being pushed. Well, in the same thing, when we talk about toxic masculinity, you know what you never hear? Toxic femininity. You know why? Because the toxic uh, masculinity is used and aimed specifically at blacks, and I'm going to explain to you why. The predominance of the discussion of toxic masculinity is the use of a European paradigm or a European concept of what masculinity is being pushed upon a black culture where we define family, we define manhood, we, we, we define everything based on a different experience. We must always look at the psychology and the sociology of any situation based on experience, based on history, based on what any particular social group has experienced and gone through. You cannot put me in the mindset, number one, I didn't originate from Europe. I originated in, in, in seminally originated from the, from the continent of Africa. If I similarly originated from the continent of Africa and that culture of how I am made as a man, and then you gotta understand if we chase it back genetically, we can go back a, a minimum of 250, 300,000 years and see the presence of my people in some form long before we ever see Europeans, then we must understand that this idea of manhood and concept is different. Now we have to look at uh the definition of toxic masculinity of itself it's it's a very dangerous concept because you take two polarizing notions two polarizing ideas two uh two very types of existence that are diametrically opposed existing on two different ends of one spectrum and you are now saying that they exist simultaneously and that they have in some way synced emerged with one another to create this poisonous 
quote unquote toxic masculinity. The truth of the matter is masculinity in its truest nature can never be toxic because it is the opposition of toxic behavior. Masculinity, it, toxic masculinity suggests that a man has lost his sense of self and becomes violent towards his woman. True masculinity will never allow a man to harm a woman. Matter of fact, true masculinity will allow, will, will demand that a man who doesn't even know a woman, a black, a black man who doesn't know a black woman, stand in defense of her if she's being harmed. True masculinity says that no black woman, matter of fact, the number one principle and rule in black man lead rite of passage Ooh. initiative is that a black man under no circumstance ever causes harm to a black female. That's the number one out of 11 principles of manhood. The first one is the protecting and the security, the peace and the safety of the black woman. So that's that that is in essence authentic true masculinity. Now, the toxic behavior that we're talking about is on the other end of the spectrum. They cannot be joined together. They cannot come together. They exist on two ends of the same spectrum. One is toxic. One is dangerous. One is poisonous. One is pure masculinity, the very nature and de definition of what manhood should be. A man should be a provider. A man should be a protector. A man should be a priest. A man should be a promoter. A man should be a prophet in his home and then in his community. He should have a sense of awareness, a sense of self, a sense of identity. But when you start talking about toxic masculinity, the first thing you do is you blur the lines of what's actually masculine. You blur, blur the lines of what's actually toxic. And before you know it, anything masculine is seen in a negative light. It starts to superimpose itself over the very definition. So in other words, we stop seeing masculinity and we only start to see toxic. So when you hear the word masculine, you start to automatically associate it with being toxic. And so now whenever a man is trying to express, express himself in his truest nature, he's automatically seen as being what? Hyper masculine, hyper aggressive, potentially violent. And that's why you get cops shooting on armed black men, because we are naturally intentional, uh, potentially violent. And we have uh, a natural aggression that's easily provoked and we are dangerous. Do you see how this thing comes? So it's not just what happens, but on the bigger side, what it produces is a type of who doesn't want to be masculine. So when when there's no true definition, no true leadership, no true goddesship, no true modeling of true manhood, the true nature of masculinity, then the pseudo idea of what masculine is seeps in and then it's relabeled toxic. But the truth of the matter is it's not masculinity at all. But what happens is you got people aspiring to it because it's how they feel they're going to be respected because we live in a culture now where fear is now viewed as respect where at one point if you were feared it meant that you didn't have good leadership qualities see when you have good leadership qualities you don't need anybody to fear you when you have good leadership qualities you don't need to be able to control or manipulate and force anybody to do anything when you have good leadership qualities people trust you People trust you to put them in the best possible position that they can be in. Doesn't mean that you're perfect. Doesn't mean that you're going to do everything the way that it should be done. It means that you are consistently showing your intentions to be the very best you can be for a specific person, for a specific family, for a specific home, for a specific community, for a specific race. And in that is where the trust comes in. So that's the subcategory that really concerns me is this whole toxic masculinity thing. It's the misuse of two terms that can never ever exist simultaneously in the same person. And it definitely can never merge and become synced and become one. There's no way to have toxic masculinity. You can have toxic behavior and you can have masculinity. You can have black masculinity, black manhood based off the black experience, and it's still powerful, it's still beautiful, it's still wonderful. It is the black man willing to stand to the point of death to protect that which he has been given the responsibility of protecting. And we exist. We exist. We exist to the point that we will be willing to put ourselves aside for the sake of our family, be willing to put ourselves on the back for the sake of our family, be willing to put our lives on the line for the sake of our family, our community, our race. We exist. So don't stop letting them tell you we don't exist. Stop letting them give you small examples, even though I see this and I deal with this on a regular basis. Intimate partner homicide. 
it's a horrible thing and you see it so consistent but you got to understand for all these things that you see there are almost 50 million of us in this country you're talking about a very small uni unit of analysis you're talking about a very small um uh group that we are measuring this on but it's the pushed narrative it's the image that's being portrayed so you don't get to see the man loving on his family they don't show that even when we're talking about entertainment they they show the mixed couples they show the gay black men they show the violent and abusive and disdaining black man but they rarely show the black man who is sacrificing for his family. They, ba they barely show the black man who will defend the black woman at all costs. They ba barely show, but we exist. I can tell you we exist because I only associate, it with, only associate with men who know how to treat black women. I don't care. And, 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 and when I say I don't care about what you're, how, what's going on with other women, it's not that I believe any woman needs to be mistreated, but I don't believe we're in a position to care about what's going on in somebody else's uh, uh, enclave. What's going on in our enclave is highly disturbing. What's going on in our enclave is this uh, highly incited constant conflict between black men and black women. And we're so engaged in our emotion and our frustration and our rage about how we feel we are being treated and being handled by the other. We are realizing that it's somebody on the outside of the jar shaking it. And until we get that, it's like if you've ever been a kid. Lord knows I've done everything I probably shouldn't have done when it comes to animals, insects and everything. No fear. Brought snakes in the house, everything else. Only thing I didn't mess with rats. Never liked rodents. But anything else, fair game. Um, but you ever take two different types of ants. And if you put them in a jar with sand so they can move around and make their little mounds. And you put them in a big jar and you put it. They will coexist. No problem. Until you shake that jar and they feel threatened. And then you will watch them attack one another. And they have di different signal frequencies. So they know who's who. And one side is attacking. Red ants and black ants attacking each other. I've watched it over. You freak me out. Leave them in there. You can leave them there for days and put stuff in there for them to eat and do their little things with. And they get along until you shake the jar. They keep shaking the jar. And we keep attacking one another. All right. So we talk about toxic masculinity. Here's another area. They are pushing, a, again, a Eurocentric idea of masculinity and manhood by way of taming the very nature of masculine expression in the sense of being men. Uh, they're doing it under the confi uh, uh, under the idea of men needing to get in touch with their emotions and as a psychologist i am 100 percent for black men becoming more aware of who we are emotionally being okay with not being okay feeling okay with need the need to cry every now and then if you're crying all the time something's not right but that, that, that sometimes you just need to release and your tears are one of the best ways to release bottled up frustration. But we we can't do it. We can't feel. And you want to know one of the reasons why we have a spike in uh, intimate partner homicide, which I think is the most devastating force that we have right now, uh, because it kills the trust that black women have in us. It lays the foundation and they hype it. It's across. You, you get that on social media and the news more than anything else. He kills his, you know, his ex. And then what we don't see are the stories where the, the, the other side is doing it too. Not that I'm looking to the other side to justify erroneous or poor behavior. I'm sitting up saying, watch how they promote it, what they give emphasis to. And you have to ask yourself why. Why is it that it wasn't a big deal here in Houston? Um. A white man got mad because his white woman girlfriend broke up with him. 
he raped all four of her daughters, 19, 17, 15, and 12, killed all of them except the 12-year-old, sent her out and told her, I forgot what, but he let her go, then barricaded himself in the house and eventually gave himself up. Or did, did he kill himself? He may have killed himself. Uh, I can't remember. It happens so often, and it's not just us. But we are the ones that get front page. We are the ones that get plastered. And again, I have no sympathy for a man who harms a woman. So this isn't me. This is me saying, but we have to be willing to ask the questions why things are done a certain way. We have to be willing to ask the questions, where is this coming from? So that's this idea of masculinity where... Um, and what, what, I, what I mentioned earlier is how they use our women to do it is on one side, they are putting this toxic masculinity thing up. And nobody throws that term around more than black women. Um, and the truth of the matter is, it's no such thing. You either have, you're either dealing with toxic behavior, which is, has nothing to do with manhood and masculinity, or you're dealing with manhood and masculinity. They are diametral, but they're pushing it. Another way that it's done is in how black women will applaud the feminization of the black male image. I'm not talking about homosexualization. I'm not talking about black men actually being sexually attracted to black men. I'm talking about the feminization and the toning down of their masculinity, the introduction of feminine accents and, and subtle behaviors that are naturally perceived as being soft. Now, when it comes to your woman, you are supposed to be soft. When it comes to your children, even your male children, that should be a level of softness. When it comes to your homeboys, when they need you, to reach over and hug them and get. But some of the things that we're seeing are, are beyond that. And then the people who are applauding it the most are black women. Think about it. all of you got a homeboy who's a homegirl. And love them to death. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with them being a homegirl. There's nothing wrong with loving. Love your people, regardless of what their uh, sexual orientation is. Love your people. Be be true to who you are, though. Speak your truth and stand your ground. Uh, I love my peeps, regardless, but they know where I stand. And I don't waver on it. And I can love you without agreeing with you. That's one of the things that we have to learn. That's what makes it so easy to shape the jar with us. Is that when someone doesn't agree with us, we get upset and we go on the offensive. We don't just say, okay, we, 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 we're going to respectfully disagree. It's like, you don't agree with me. I'm going to do everything I can to destroy you. I'm going to do everything I can to tear you down. I'm going to do everything I can to discredit you. So that nobody will take your story over mine or take your position over mine and that's a devastating place to be in but let's look at this again we have to be very careful and understand how the dynamic of social uh, the social dynamic of family works the man is the protector even before he's the provider we teach our young boys that that you become physically capable of defending a girl your same age long before you become mentally, emotionally, and financially able of providing for her. Your first element and component is going to be that of defending and protecting. And then, yes, you need to develop a capacity of providing, but provision is so much more than the money that you bring, the bills that you pay. Are you providing a secure environment? Are you providing leadership? Are you providing guidance? Are you providing encouragement? Are you providing spiritual insight? Are you the safest place that she can be in? These are things that you provide outside of money, but we've been commodified. So nobody's looking at that. Everybody's talking about the bag. And so if you don't have a bag, you look down on If so you don't have a bag, you start looking down on yourself. So then it starts to be about the bag. The problem is when you get the bag and the only thing that people are focused on the bag, you begin to objectify the people who are seeking the bag. They just want the bag. They're only with me for the bag. So if they're with me for the bag, I'm going to use the bag to manipulate and control. 
we dealt with this. This isn't new. We dealt with this in, in, in the 50s and 60s. A lot of women stayed with husbands, if we're going to be honest, because they were the providers. And there was no other answer. So what they did is they gave the woman an out. You can leave him now because we got you. You can either come into corporate America and make it on your own or we'll send you subsidies and you can sit at home and chill. And either way, you have a roof over your head and food in your pantry. And we were so lost men that we didn't stand our ground and fight to stay. Uh, we could point fingers and do all that shit. That's not why I'm here today. The bottom line is they shook the damn jar. They've been shaking the jar and we keep falling for it. So let me explain something to you. We need to have men who are men. That means they know how to be gentle with a woman. They know how to protect a woman. But they also know how to take a fool's head off when they step out of line. That has to that that's a part of masculinity that says not on my watch. That's what they don't want. They don't want that in the black community. They don't want not on my watch in the black community. They don't want a substantial number of black men saying, we'll die before we let you do that here. Not on my watch. You're not going to harm our women on my watch. You're not going to push that trash in the community on my watch. You're not going to flood our schools with bullshit on our watch. And you're not going to come in and kill our kids on our watch. But if they can consistently feminize, if they can consistently make it okay to be soft. And I don't mean gentle. There's a difference when I'm defining this. Gentle means I know how to touch my woman. I know how to talk to my woman. I know how to deal with my woman when we're in conflict. I'm not going to argue with you. Never raise my voice. Never call you out your name. We can be at odds. But never be dangerous to one another that's so important but it starts with the leadership of the man the woman is going to go in a lot of different ways the way that you go if she doesn't feel safe you're going to feel it and you've got to find a way to make that right but what what, what happens is that's gentle you need to be gentle with your kids the, the old hard, I'm going to beat your ass, do all this stuff like that. You're breaking them. Now, there comes a time that you're going to have to sit down with that young buck of yours, men, and establish the pecking order. That's just what it is. He's starting to feel himself. He needs to know at certain different stages, this ain't what you want, son. Dad's got you, but you don't want it. Trust me, you don't want it. And you get everybody understands the rules. Everybody understands the circle, but this beating on kids... If I were to go out right now and I were to ask somebody for something in the store and they gave me what I didn't want and I beat their ass, I would be charged with assault, I'd be arrested. If I uh, were to be married and come home and I were to say to my wife, where's my food? And she said, I haven't cooked it yet. And I were to physically assault her i would be charged with domestic violence and i would be arrested if i were to do that in any other instances and now it's coming down to you can't do it to your kids either uh and and what you have to understand is there's still ways to discipline kids and then if you know there's also like i said going to be a time when they try you and they try you you apply enough force to set the tone and make it understood but the idea of doing to them what our ancestors had done to us when we didn't do what the master said didn't turn out well. For, we're still trying to get over that shit, and you don't think it, it's hurting your kid. Take it from someone who deals with the kids that have grown up behind that. The whole, I turned out fine? No, you didn't. Nobody who turns out fine is talking about hitting somebody because they don't do what they say they should do. Because trust me, I used to be that person. I grew up getting my ass whipped when things didn't work. So my first few kids, that first that first level, I've got 13. So I've literally had generations where I've got them 37 and 8. Well, she'll be 9 in a few days. So, and all in between. And what I can tell you is, those first few, when I was still young and hadn't learned what I was starting to learn, 
They got the business. My daughter didn't, but my two boys caught it. Uh, and then all of a sudden I started learning. And what I can tell you is I get more disciplined behavior out of kids I never put my hands on than the ones I used to hit all the time. Also get better results at school. Ain't nothing like a kid that's anxious because they're afraid they're going to get hit if something goes wrong at school. Just trust me on that. Thousands of encounters. I, I kind of know. But here's what I'm getting at. And then I'll be done. That's being gentle. Being soft. is sitting up seeing all hell break loose under your watch and being unwilling to touch it because it's not how you're built. You're not built to go handle somebody who's handling your kid. You're not built to go handle somebody who's disrespecting your wife. You're not built to go out and handle something that's coming into your community and creating a dangerous environment that's disrupting the natural order of growth, healing, and health in your freaking community. That's the softness that's being promoted. Oh, that's so sweet. That's so cute. It's nothing wrong with that. Bullshit. Do I believe, I've said it already, do I believe black men need to become more aware and engaged and with their vulnerability and their emotions? Absolutely. This nothing can be wrong with me thing is killing us. This I can't possibly need help, real men don't need help, is destroying us. Real men don't cry has broken a bunch of us. So I, I, I'm saying, yes, we need to do that, but there's a way to do that. But it, it, it's not in the softening of the natural mechanism to protect. The last thing that the powers that be want are black men who are willing to stand up and defend our homes, our communities, and our race with our lives. When you go back and you think about it, if you are like me and you're from the hood, that's a pretty good chance unless you just was one of those kids. And that, that was our kids. Everybody knew them. They weren't going to fight. They were nerdy as hell, but nobody bothered them. But if you were like me, you were smart, but you were always into something. This is what you, you, you understand is... Somebody that's in the hood, somebody that grew up in that environment where it's constant violence. You have something you're willing to die for. And early on in my life, the stupid stuff that I was willing to die for, thank God I didn't, has definitely changed. What somebody says to me now, you know, unless they within reach but what, what somebody's saying is going to get me in a situation where I'm going to lose it and be willing to risk my life unless I feel you're a threat. And if I feel you're a threat, by the time you realize I think you're a threat, you won't ever be a threat again. That's just the way I was moved. My grandfather taught me. One thing he taught me, he taught me a lot. Don't spit box. You sense a threat, neutralize it. And that's what I plan on doing with my family. That's what I plan on doing with myself. That's what I plan on doing. And I hope I never have to harm anybody. But the bottom line is we need to be willing. But there's a constant agenda to soften us, to make us more acceptable, to, to, to not just in society in general, but specifically to white men who will not admit it, but are immensely threatened by what they see as a, uh, a physically superior being. Where another problem is coming in, and that's why they have intensified this agenda to soften the black male image, to feminize the black male image. And when I say feminize the black male image, I'm, speak, I'm speaking specifically of heterosexual men, especially men that black women find attractive. But one of the reasons, there's always been this problem with the physical superiority issue. But now we are making it exceptionally clear 
that we can stand on the intellectual stage with them and that we're not intimidated by them intellectually and that the number of people who can do this is growing. And what I love, I love a black man with internet intellectual prowess who is okay with being him, who isn't trying to fit their intellectual capacity into a Eurocentric idea of what is, who's okay with having opposing views, who is okay with having a couple of double negatives every now and then, or using uh, profanity to make a point, or anything that's a part of who they are. There's nothing wrong with speaking the King's English, if, if that's what you're going to communicate with. I suggest learning multiple languages. It's only going to increase your capacity to consume, to understand, and communicate. The better you are at communicating, the more powerful of a force you become. Um, but what we cannot do is allow them through subtle means and measures to introduce narratives that do not serve us. We must learn to question what's being presented and why are we participating in things that contribute to our demise we must ask can this possibly serve us or is this harmful to us and we must be able to critically break it down and then act accordingly we cannot consistently be allowing them to shake that jar I could go on, but I'm going to stop here and I'm going to challenge everybody that's listening to think about what's being shared here. This isn't about me coming from a know it all position. This is about me using my experience, my knowledge, my expertise and what I do for a living and the amount of time and energy I've spent researching over nearly 80,000 hours, 78,000 and something hours of logged academic research into the history and the state of black America. Everything from slavery, black codes, convict leasing, uh, gentrification, uh, serial force displacement, uh, mass incarceration, uh, African American adolescent young adult male violence, uh, intimate partner violence, mental illness, all of these things I've spent all this time and I've disseminated it in books. I'm about to release book number 26. This is going to be more of a personal form, but I just given it so much of myself. We've got to be given to winning. We have to be given to winning. Expecting somebody to hand us what they have kept from us for so long is senseless so my challenge is that we stand up my challenge is that we start to make moves my challenge is that we start to understand that there are people shaking the jar so that black men blame black women and black women blame black men and that black men sit up and push for an idea of a black woman that cannot be the birther of the vision and black women push for black men who do not have the wherewithal or desire to stand up and provide the environment of security that they need and they don't even realize they're doing it. On that note, look, um, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, as I stated at the beginning of this, and you saw in the intro, we need your support. Uh, if you believe in the work we're doing, if you believe in the things that I'm passionate about, that I've been bringing to the table, the work that we're doing in the community, the, the, the push for change, real change, not, not just this talk, but change, actually taking the elements and components of change and applying them at every level from our babies all the way up. If you believe in it, we need your support. On that note, I'm out of here. I want to thank you for allowing me to take up uh, almost 45 minutes of your time. Uh, the links that you need to support what we do will be in the description box. You can give in a number of different ways, uh, including Cash App. On that note, I am out of here. Guys. Thank you.